again, this is my very first um, uh, virtual building event. And so uh, if there are some small technical difficulties, just uh, I hope you guys are okay with it. Um, so today uh, we're going to be talking about the uh, Walking Mountains um, buildings on our campus. We have uh, the Center for Sustainability, which I am currently in. Um, and then we also have our Pete and Pat Frechette educator housing, which is down at the bottom of our hill, if anyone's been to campus recently. Um, we did a lot of really cool, innovative things in these two buildings, and so we're excited to share that with you guys. Um, so this group, um, for those who don't know, um, we started the Eco Valley Green Building Group, or I should say restarted the Eco Valley Green Building Group um, about two years ago um, in an effort organized under the Climate Action Collaborative for the Eagle County Community. Um, the Climate Action Collaborative is a partnership of um, a bunch of organizations in Eagle County that um, are working together to achieve our climate action plan goals, which are a greenhouse gas reduction goal of 25% uh, by 2025 and 80% by 2050. Um, and so we formed uh, the Eagle Valley Green Building Group as a way of bringing together the building sector in our community or the um, uh, yeah, the building sector, um, making sure that our, um, you know, professionals were able, had, a, had an outlet to network and share best practices and connect um, so that we could all learn um, and really grow um, professionally in the Valley. Um, so that's why we're here. Um, this is again, our first virtual USGBC or Eagle Valley Green Building Group event. Um, so we're happy to have you guys. And a couple of quick housekeeping things before um, I pass it off to our first presenters. Um, this webinar is a webinar. So that means that all of you guys who are logged in, um, your faces aren't shown. Um, and we also, um, only your names uh, can pop up. You also aren't able to unmute yourselves. So if you guys have questions throughout, um, please use the Q&A um, function down at the bottom of uh, your webinar um, for questions. If you guys wanna just chat amongst yourselves while the presentation is going on, there's a chat box for that. Um, and then we also are going, uh, this is being recorded on YouTube so we can share it with folks who weren't here um, and wanted to see the event. So just so everyone's aware, it is gonna be recorded. Um, and with that, I, we're good? We're good? Nope, I think just no sound. Turn your sound off. There we go. We're there, okay. <laughs> We're gonna go ahead and get started with uh, Brian Sipes from um, Sipes Architects and Derek Place, the Avon building official, um, are gonna spend the first 20 minutes of our uh, event tonight talking about the Pete and Pat Frechette Educator Community Housing. Um, then we'll pass it off to Nikki Moline and Bill Braden who will be talking about um, the performance for our Center for Sustainability and some cool technology that we have in this building. Um, and then we'll end uh, the event today with Barry Monroe who was um, on the RA Nelson team for both projects, I believe. And um, he's gonna be talking us through the mechanical systems that we have in the Center for Sustainability. Um, so with that, um, Matt, can you please pass it over to Brian um, to get us started? And Brian, just let me know when you want me to advance the slides. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, my name is Brian Sipes. I'm the... Uh, owner of Sipes Architects, a small architecture firm here in the Valley. We're located in Minturn. We uh, were fortunate enough to be the architects on the Pete and Pat Frechette Educator Community. And uh, I was the original architect on the original two, three campus buildings uh, 10 years ago. So um, I think we can advance. Actually, Kim, before we get started, I sent you an email just a second ago with a couple of other photographs. Okay. Um, I wasn't sure if you could just pull those up or if I can share my screen. Can I share my screen? Um, Matt, can right. have him? Nope, it's disabled. Um, okay, let me see. I'll pull, I'll pull them up really quick. Okay. We don't, and just have those maybe in the background. We can get started with uh, the first slide that you had. I just realized that we didn't have any overall pictures of the building other than this one, but it doesn't really show the solar. 
Yeah, no worries. So we can go to the first slide. Great. So um, the the educator community buildings were conceived along with the original campus as a, as a way to house um, educators on site. So they've been long a dream of the Walking Mountains to have this. And uh, when we got started about a year ago, uh, looking into this, we wanted to figure out a way to inject some sustainable components into what is otherwise a, an affordable housing project. And so um, we also had as a goal net zero for these projects. So uh, in looking at those two things, we knew that we wanted to balance the energy production on site with the energy use on site, which is essentially what net zero means. And to do that, we first looked at reducing the amount of energy required in the buildings as much as we could without breaking the bank. And so we looked at some uh, alternative construction methods to increase the thermal envelope, um, our value. And then we looked for affordable windows that would be better than code as well. Um, along with that, we went with some efficient mechanical systems. In case anyone doesn't know, if you're trying to go for net zero, you pretty much can't have natural gas fuel burned on site. It's impossible to balance the BTUs from fossil fuel sources with um, electrical energy consumption. It's a, that math is, is just more difficult. So if you just go all electric, you are essentially dealing with one source of energy on the production and the consumption side. And then there's also, it frees up some resources from Holy Cross Energy, our local energy provider that we wanted to tap into. So we went all electric um, and we went with uh, a mini split, which is a heat pump technology. And, um, and we made sure the buildings were tight. And so we introduced ERVs as well and uh, balanced those into the mini split system. Um, on the right there, you can see a photograph of the insulated envelope. And one of the things that we want to talk to about a lot tonight is the T studs, which were a framing product that we uh, used on this job that are insulated. So the studs themselves achieve an R value of R20. So you essentially have no thermal bridge at the framing. We were able to do the math and speak with Derek Place at the town of Avon and collaborate with him on figuring out the testing necessary to prove that this wall would perform at or better than a similar wall built to code prescriptively with a continuous insulation envelope on the exterior, which is um, the way it's typically done in our valley. So uh, by eliminating that exterior insulation, which sticks out one to two inches, we eliminate all the special detailing needed at windows, uh, special detailing at trim. We simplified a lot of the construction techniques down to simple stud framing, but at the same time achieved a very high performing building envelope. So uh, we can go to the next slide. I can't remember the sequence of these. Okay, so here's just some photographs. You can see in the upper left corner, um, the slightly yellower middle of the studs, that's the foam insulation. So essentially the studs are two two by threes um, turned perpendicular to what would normally be the stud orientation. And then those two parallel studs are connected with one inch dowels that zigzag back and forth forming a truss. And then the whole thing is foamed in place, the foam itself giving it some extra rigidity and sheer capacity. Um, and we went the extra mile to actually use those same studs in the top and bottom plates. We used high performance framing, so we only needed one top plate, as you can see in that bottom photo. And then the headers were also engineered to have a two inch space of rigid insulation between them. So we essentially have a continuous thermal break from the sheathing to the roof trusses. Um, so we have the equivalent of an exterior continuous insulation, but we have it on the interior of the wall. Um, on the right, you can see the window detailing, but it also shows the SIGA MatchFest um, 500 weather barrier that we used, which is a product that's being carried locally um, in Eagle 
and it's a very high performing, breathable, but weather resistant barrier, self-adhesive that's coming out of Switzerland. Um, very excited about that product. It's incredibly easy to install. It uh, is incredibly high performing and um, they have a whole system of tapes that go along with it for repairs and for sealing windows, as you can see in that photograph. So we haven't done the blower door test yet, but we expect this building to uh, be incredibly tight. Go to the next slide. Um, Derek, I think these are your pictures. I just wanted to point out the insulation on the exterior of the foundation. The foundation here, as with I think all the buildings at Walking Mountains, the soils here are, um, it's an alluvial fan coming out from the valley. So we went on helical piers down, I believe 25 feet. The original campus, I think those piers are 30 to 40 feet deep. Um, so we have essentially grade beams, concrete walls on top of them and forming a crawl space, but we insulated both the exterior and the interior of the concrete um, to achieve an insulated and thermally connected conditioned crawl space. And then I think I'll let Derek, do you wanna step in and talk about the issues that you saw during construction, especially related to figuring out how to use the T-studs? Oh, you're actually there. So one of the, the challenges is with any new material, and uh, Kim, you have some photos that I can show of the, yeah. the actual framing? Right here. Okay, there's... Um, Which one? You, this one? Yeah, that's a good one right there. That's a good one. So as you mentioned, Brian, you're dealing with an R20 product. And I actually have a T-stud right here. In front of me, so you can see dimensionally how big it is, how wide it is. And this material here in the middle, we're talking about here's the foam. Here's the two by two wood with dowels. I don't know if anybody can see the actual dowels that go through to form what is basically a truss, a wood truss filled with foam. So we use these and you can see in some of the photos and especially in the middle photo, you can see the actual foam. So we have wood on the outside that the OSB is attached to and then drywall is attached to the inside of the T-stud with the foam in between them. This is where we create our thermal break. Uh, the biggest violation we see in wood framing is when you have solid two buys running through a house is you get uh, the transfer of coal through that wood stud. And I've heard the numbers is anywhere from R5 to R1 per inch in wood. So again, you have a two by six stud, the most you could have would be R6 or less in that cavity. So you end up with a cold spot or a hot spot. Um, we actually use these T studs in the bottom plates. And you can see from the illustration where you see the foot and you'll see a bottom plate. Um, there's actually a T stud on the bottom. And then we also used them on the top plate. If you go to the very top of the wall, you'll see the T stud is also the top of the wall. So that thermal barrier by code is required to be there. And it's an R5 on the exterior sheathing, or in this case, it's a new product where we brought the R value inside the stud and created the thermal break inside the stud. I will say from a practical standpoint, if you look at the first illustration to the left, you'll see some nails sticking out. These are four inch nails and the guns are extremely big and heavy. They're not conventional equipment. So there's a learning curve in putting these together. And I know they struggled initially and I gave Brian a call way in the very beginning because they were blowing through the sides of these studs. And I think it was just a matter of getting control of the gun and understanding how to get these nails in properly. But other than that, it went seamless. We really had no issues. Um, there, if you wanna switch this slide, Kim, I'll show them. Uh, next one. Okay, you'll notice to the left, you'll see an inside corner and you'll see a, a galvanized strap up there, typically like a 16 gauge Simpson coil strap for the inside and the outside corners because these top plates butt, they don't lap. In normal framing construction, you have a lap joint and a double top plate. They'll have a, a double top, a double bottom plate also on a wall. So we have single plates, both top and bottom. 
So we had to put these flat straps in to form a gusset where these connections come. And if you notice, the, the framing is all stacked. If you look at the uh, drawing to the right, you'll see that that stud lines up with that floor joist above. So layout is very critical. The other thing, I, if you want to go back one slide, the one where the framing is, okay. you'll notice the interior framing. If you look at that little pony wall in the kitchen, right in here, this wall, that's conventional lumber. And that can be conventional lumber because we're now in the interior environment. So the only area where you have the T studs are on the exterior walls. But once we come into the interior framing, and if you look to the, the drawing on the left where your mechanicals are run through, your dryer vents, your uh, HRBs, your electrical wiring, that's conventional framing and so is the floor system. So it's all conventional framing once we get inside the one thing that is a challenge, I would say, would be to not allow any plumbing or mechanical systems in the outside wall. And normally we'd want to do that anyways, but there's just not room there for them in the T-studs. Um, and we don't want to compromise the dowels in between the top and the bottom cord. In this case, it's inside outside of the T-stud the itself. But conventional framing, once you get inside, regular uh, plumbing, re regular electrical, regular mechanical systems fit in your walls, just as you would with any conventional frame. Let's take a look at the, the next slide. I think that's it, just those three. Yep. Uh, so the challenge is how do you take a T-stud that's not ICC certified approved and allow it to be used in a construction method? So as I touched on briefly, the code in the energy code, the international energy code requires you to have an R value of five continuous insulation on the exterior. So what that involves is zip panel systems, which I am not a fan of. Um, I actually have uh, over at the Riverfront Lodge shear walls that were created with OSB that we had to put a zip panel over top of the OSB on the exterior walls to develop enough shear strength. So the, the problem is with a poly ISO attachment to a stud on the exterior wall, you end up with, you lack rigidity and you, lack, and you actually lack, in some cases, the structural su support that you need. So you have to actually put OSB on the, the outside of the stud first and then put the zip panel to get the R5 continuous insulation. So you're ending up spending more money to try and develop shear strength in a wall. Where in this system with a T stud, you can actually put your sheathing right on the outside and develop your shear wall strength. So there, there's an advantage to using this. Um, the other advantage would be if you had a ledger for a deck, you have to pull the zip panel off because you can't attach a ledger to poly ISO. Again, you have that shim in there on the exterior of the wall. So by removing the poly ISO on the outside and, and putting it in between the studs, you eliminate the, the shear wall issue on the exterior of the building. So, I would add to that, to Eric, that you know, from an architectural standpoint too, the one product solves all issues thing never sits well with me with respect to zip panels. So with a zip panel, you required to use their facing as the weather barrier. So it's all it's an all-in-one system, which makes it attractive from an installation standpoint, but you have no option. And as an architect, I like to be able to pick the products. And so I think you can get a higher performance out of like the SIGA barrier that we used here. So again, it takes that issue off the table. I can choose the weather barrier. I can choose the envelope condition if I'm going back to essentially a conventional frame and getting rid of that exterior insulation. Yeah, so even a conventional tieback system or even yep. felt, um, any water barrier that you put on the outside of the, the house and there's you know probably 200 popular brands that we use out there. The drain plane is on the exterior of the T-stud versus the zip panel, which you don't put another barrier on, you put tape on it. And then you have to make sure you don't over nail. And then you have to make sure you haven't blown out the corners because if you hit the OSB on a zip panel with a, with a hammer, you can just crush the corners and it's very fragile. It's not a structural rigidity uh, material that I prefer. So it's never been uh, one of my choices. So we did a hybrid system where we would spray foam on the inside of the studs and we allowed that for a period of time. And actually, that's a compromise. It doesn't meet code. But, you know, this system is actually put together. And the issue I had was it was not approved by ICC. 
International Code Council. So I had to come up with a way to justify how I could install these T studs and have them meet code. And if you go to the very beginning of the administrative section of the ICC, and we're in the 2015 over here in Avon, in the very beginning, it has the intent, the scope and general requirements. The code is intended, and I'm reading directly from the code now, section C101.3. The code is intended to provide flexibility to permit the use of innovative approaches and techniques to achieve the objective. So right away, the code does say the idea is to use different ideas and means and methods. And then if you go to the next section of the code, one of, and this is the administrative section, alternative methods, materials of construction design and insulating systems. The code is not intended to prevent the use of any material method or construction design or insulating system, not specifically described herein, provided that each construction design or insulating system has been approved by the code official and meeting the intent of this code. So I believe that this system met the intent of the code. And I did put Brian through the mill on this one because I made him provide structural certification. I made him certify that uh, it met all the technical evaluation reports that they have that are equivalent to the ICC evaluation service reports. Now this actually came out of a Dr. J certification, um, which is an ANSI certification, which is parallel to the ICC and um, ANSI is similar, very similar. And it was designed by a Colorado registered engineer and it didn't come out of Canada with a, a foreign country stamp on it. So it met the, uh, the structural compression, uh, loading, um, the stamping is all uniform and consistent. Anytime you have an engineered product, you're gonna have consistency on that too. The R values like we mentioned are up to R20. Um, and with all the supporting documentation, I felt that the ANSI certification from Dr. J was equivalent to what ICC evaluation services provide. So did it meet the exact letter of the law based on ICC? No, but the code does allow me to, to be innovative and to use um, systems that intend to be equivalent to the requirements of the code. So we basically used a U factor versus an R factor and came up with what we believed was a very good system. And other than that fact, like I said, there was a learning curve when they first started putting it in. The system went up very smooth. Um, it's a little different technique in terms of what we showed you earlier with straps in the corners. But the bottom plate and the top plate um, were a T-stud just laid horizontal. And then the actual headers themselves, we opened those up and we inserted foam in between two micro lamps. So we have a micro lamp on the outside of the T-stud, similar, similar spread. So the loading was on the exterior of the two by two, not on the foam. And we opened up the, the headers. So two micro lamps set on inside and outside of that T-stud. <laughs> headers sat here. We filled the headers with foam. And that's how we achieved the continuation of this foam sandwich all the way through the house. So a really good system. Uh, highly recommended, and I would like to see more um, builders doing it, and I'm a firm believer in this product. Awesome. Kim, is there a way for me to share my screen? I wanted to, I think Derek just gave a perfect segue into the analysis that we performed in order to get this approved. Um, Let's see, I think I can. And Brian, um, if we maybe we have about like two more minutes, and then we should dive into some questions. I've seen a bunch of hands yeah. raised, so I want to make sure we have some time yeah, for that. Yeah, I think but, this will be good. I can do it in two minutes. I just want to go through okay. the spreadsheet where we proved the R value equivalent. Perfect. So you should be able to share your screen. Let me know if you ah, can. Yep, I can. There we go. Awesome. So uh, as Derek mentioned, he put me through the ringer, but um, we were <laughs> glad to do it. No, I mean, I think rigor is important when, with respect to anything. And um, we did a, uh, in the International Residential Code, there's a section R402.1.4 is the alternative calculation method for um, thermal resistance. And so, we start. We did that calculation for Derek, but it actually prompted a whole nother exploration by me, and I started playing what if. And so, in this spreadsheet, um, I I started calculating different 
ways to build walls with different components. So this is um, the, the straight method without continuous insulation. And uh, I was looking at this primarily because the town of Vail right now has an amendment to the IECC that allows um, that exterior insulation or continuous insulation to be eliminated. So the, these are all different layers of the wall assembly. These are code prescriptive um, values for those layers. I got that right out of the code. I didn't invent anything except for, for the insulation itself. I use the insulation values. And then these percentages of the components. So this is the framing. These are headers. And this is the cavity between the framing. So these are straight out of the code as well. So a normal wall framed to meet the either the town of Ailes amendment or just without continuous insulation with the code percentages has an effective R value of essentially 16. Um, and then I just went through all different scenarios doing the continuous insulation gets you up to the R21, which is essentially what the code is requiring. So without the continuous insulation, we don't get there. With it, we do. Um, if you increase that continuous insulation, you can get to an effective R value of 23. You can go through and that, but that's, that's what the code says in the best constructed home. What we typically see in this value, as Derek said, are these massive stud packs to support structural elements and we get a lot of wood. So I increase the amount of framing and decrease the amount of cavity and it changed the R values down to here. Just to cut this short, Here's what it looks like with P studs. Without the continuous insulation and a high percentage of framing, we are still at an effective R value of 26 for the entire wall, minus windows, of course. Um, if you add continuous insulation to that and do it in a way that uh, makes sense, you can really jump these numbers up. So what this shows is the T stud product dramatically outperforms conventional framing, even with continuous insulation. So that's all I wanted to say. Awesome. Um, thanks, Brian. So yes. now we'll um, do Q&A and I apologize. Uh, we can't have everyone unmute themselves. And so we'll just, um, we will have, uh, I'll just read the questions out loud, but if you have questions, please drop them in the Q&A function and um, we'll ask and make sure they get answered. So um, question from Seth. The way I understand the continuous insulation requirement is that it need not be on the exterior wall of the assembly, although this is common. Since the minimum R value is R20 plus R5 continuous insulation, it could be achieved in a number of ways, on the outside, in the middle, like the T-stud, or a double stud wall with one inch space or an interior service cavity, et cetera. Brian or Derek? That, that, that is Sorry. true, but so uh, I just, um, I want to answer that one because we actually did that on the original campus buildings because we were sort of forced to due to the deep foundations. But if you don't do it on the exterior, you are you basically create a thermal break at every floor um, interruption because that th if it's inside the wall or if it's a double stud, it's going to hit the sheathing and it won't be continuous through the floor. Neither is T stud, um, but T stud moves that. Uh, thermal break closer to the exterior so it, there's not as much of an offset. So that would be one consideration I would look at. But I do think you're right that um, there are other ways to achieve it. And that's essentially the attitude we had going into this when we were looking for what eventually led us to T-STUD. I was just going to mention you, you, you covered the floor system, which I think is a uh, commonly missed area, the rim, uh, that interstitial space between the floor and the ceiling below. The, even the staggering of studs doesn't eliminate that issue. And the other thing I've seen is where people have actually put polystyrene foam, you know, blue or pink foam on the inside of the wall, inside of the stud, and then fur that out again. So we have seen it inside and outside, but the problem is trying to follow that line all the way through with the T-stud and with a header system all the way up through with bottom and top plates, you continually keep that thermal break between the two wood framing members in the same location. There's the advantage. Right, and uh, on the original campus at Walking Mountains, 
we had a structural floor since the soil wouldn't support um, the floor. So if you can imagine the two um, walls coming down with insulation between, we lined up that insulation with a two inch foam poured between the structural slab and the topping slab. So we actually achieved a continuous insulation running up the wall because the topping slab died into the inner stud wall. So we thought about that thermal break and solved it. But I think if you were just to approach it on a conventional house, that's a very hard thing to achieve. Thanks, guys. So uh, Scott had a question, and I think um, we'll have this be the last question for this session, and then we'll pass it off um, to make sure we have time for our other presenters. And then if there are any questions that are missed at the end, um, again, drop them in the chat, and we'll make sure they get answered before the webinar is over. But um, from Scott, Breckenridge dropped continuous uh, by dense packing to R25. Have you done a cost comparison of T-studs to dense packing? Well, the first of all is they're not equal. The dense packing, and I'm happy to share this spreadsheet with anybody, and you can plug whatever numbers you want to into the cavity, but you always you don't get rid of the thermal breaks by dense packing. And that's always going to take, you know, I don't know, 30% of the capacity or of the uh, efficiency out of the wall. So you need to do something to break the to to get rid of the thermal breaks. And just adding more insulation in the cavity doesn't get you there. Awesome. That is the, the hybrid system that we referred to where they would take spray foam and spray the inside of the stud cavities. And again, you still have thermal bridging, stud packs, uh, some massive uh, timber loads in some of these big houses. It's a better system than just bibs and bats, but it still doesn't achieve or eliminate thermal bridging. Awesome. All right. Um, thanks, Brian. And thanks so much, Derek. Um, I... Uh, we'll share contact information out for every presenter. So if you guys have questions specifically uh, for these guys, uh, feel free to reach out to them. And then Brian, yeah, it'd be great. You don't mind sharing that spreadsheet with me. I can make sure it gets sent out to. Watch. Yeah, I just yeah. Uh, I just did the one and upped the cavity insulation on that assembly to R25, and the effective R value of the wall remains at R15. Okay. Um, awesome. And so with that, I believe we're going to switch presenters over to. Nikki and um, Nikki, do you want to go ahead and share your screen? Hi, everyone. Thanks for listening today. I'm going to quickly talk to you kind of about the features here in the Borgen Precourt Center for Sustainability. Uh, and then I'm going to pass it over to Bill Braden, who is um, an expert at energy demand management and has some technology that he's put in our building and he's going to share with you um, how that can apply to many different commercial applications. So first, the um, Borgen Precourt Center for Sustainability, I'm going to focus really on the building science of it, the performance, and then a little bit on build, building automation and then pass it over to Bill to kind of expand on building automation with his um, demand management. This building was built um, and occupied in April, April-ish of May, or April, May of 2019 was kind of when it was done and occupied. We're here in Avon at the Walking Mountain Science Center um, campus. You can see with the picture on the right there that we're kind of across the street from the main campus there. It was built to the 2015 IBC IECC codes. Um, the use of the building is mostly offices and meetings and seminars. We have a little kitchen in here, but um, most of the regular occupancy is office space um, on the north side there, the second and third floor. And then the, the first and second floor on the south side there are common spaces, meeting spaces, and a little kitchen and, and some bathrooms and stuff. It's two stories, 25 feet. So it's an all electric building. That's right, there's no gas, which we've kind of been talking a lot about lately. Um, it's been designed to easily transform into a net zero facility if we um, do just a few more things and go that direction. Currently the solar array on the roof was projected to provide about 50% of the building's annual total energy needs. And an expansion of that array in the future could allow us to operate at net zero consumption on an annual basis. So more to come about solar PV in the next couple of slides. Um, and how much of our usage has been covered over the last year to kind of give you an idea of how it's been. 
by pairing an all electric design with rooftop solar panels, demand limiting equipment and monitoring of major electrical loads. This building is, was poised to have maximum control over its energy costs. And we'll talk a little bit more about that moving forward as well. So how much did it cost to go all electric? The designing all electric is generally cheaper than designing with gas. We saved about $10,000 from not running a gas line to the building. In addition to savings of the cost of hooking up to the gas line and coordination of that. Many devices like electric boilers, water heaters are actually cheaper than their gas counterparts generally and don't need a vent pipe. So I'll tell you briefly about the systems kind of um, included in this all electric building, but obviously Barry is gonna talk really a lot more about in detail about the mechanical systems coming up after Bill. So stay tuned for that. We do have an air source heat pump. It's ducted and that provides heating and cooling to all of our office spaces. That second and third level um, has programmable Wi-Fi thermostats. Those are Honeywell Redlink and it pro can provide simultaneous heating and cooling. The ducts are shared in office spaces with the ERVs. Um, and there's one large heat pump condensing unit that sits in the back of the building. You'll see that picture there, like the third over. And by utilizing an air source heat pump, uh, these spaces can heat and cool extraordinarily efficiently with electricity. We do have a couple electric boilers. Those provide radiant heating to the floor in the classroom areas, kitchen, comma spaces, um, both floors on the south side. Those are um, two Thermalec modulating boilers and I'm sure Barry's gonna talk maybe even more about that as well. And then we have three ERVs. Um, so if nobody's in the building, these are not on there. Had they have occupancy sens sensors around the building and then they have 15 minute run times um, when occupancy is detected. We also have inline duct heaters to temper that air in those ERVs to 70 degrees. Um, and then water heaters, we have a couple electric tank water heaters that are very, very small. Um, we don't generally use much hot water in this building at all. And then we have LED lighting with some sensors. And we also have that dual EV charger outside. So our building envelope is, is awesome. Um, we have an efficient design. As you can see, I have some insulation levels over there on the right. Um, but from the mechanical systems to the insulation systems and windows, this building was designed to use low amounts of energy. Lower a blower door test was performed at the end of construction to test the air infiltration through the building envelope. The building performed outstanding. Um, so the building contains an excellent insulation package, including continuous ins insulation on the walls and the roof. Uh, this prevents heat loss through weak points caused by building framing and other thermal bridges. We have high performance windows, the U factor is uh, 0.25. They're dual glazed with low E and that exceeds what the requirement was. The roof assembly quickly is an R50, R50 um, and that's a combination of SIP panels and EPS foam. The slab in, um, insulation is R15 um, and that's uh, under, that's because since our slab is heated um, and that's an R40 rigid foam. Exterior wall insulation, um, wall cavity and continuous, it came to an R32.4. It's uh, continuous insulated sheathing and blown in cellulose insulation and drywall. Floor insulation came to an R53.07. It's continuous insulation, insulated sheathing and blown in cellulose in the cavity. And then the basement wall insulation for the mechanical electrical elevator rooms, that was R20 and everywhere else in the basement area was R33.2. Hey Nikki, um, this is Kim. I don't know if you're, we're trying to show the R values, but I can only see the mechanical equipment. I'm so sorry. That is completely my fault because I'm on two screens and can't seem to handle two screens merely. I apologize. <laughs> we'll just stand one second on the screen and I'm sure we will send out this presentation and it's being recorded. So if anybody wants to reference this slide again, we can provide it or get a hold of me and I'm happy to send it to you. Thanks for letting me know. <laughs> We also have some HVAC controls, basically the Honeywell Red Link. This is both for our boilers for the in-floor heat and for the, um, air, the air source heat pump for both office spaces. And you can see just on this page a fun 
uh, way of looking at thermostats online. We can view all the thermostats and, and change them anytime. Um, so that's just a sample of what we see online there to the left. And we do get these nice reports from Honeywell kind of comparing year to year um, and showing us what the difference is in our heating and cooling and, and even the outside um, temperature difference to kind of compare that to. And then we have some energy mon monitoring. So we're using E-Gage and what we're monitoring there is total electrical usage, mechanical panels, lighting panels, miscellaneous load panels, energy recovery ventilators, heat pumps, elevator and car chargers. So as you'll see at the, my last slide about the performance, I'm gonna show you what the E-Gage looked like for the last year. So you can kind of see what our performance was, but E-Gage also provides these um, really fun graphics with information about money saved and carbon offsets and this is just for a three day summary just this last week kind of gives you an example there. And then this is our energy demand management, um, and this is exactly what Bill Braden's going to talk about here coming up in a few slides. And it's all about kind of limiting your impact on the grid. So automatic controls can delay the use of some electrical loads um, or instantaneous usage, usage um, or if, if it's getting too high. So once the usage drops, those loads will turn back on and this makes the building easier on the local grid when you use these kind of systems. So um, I'm gonna let Bill talk a little bit more about that, but basically this graph, which he'll show you another one of these, will show you on the upper part, the green bars are our different loads, which I can see, you can see in the box, what are we controlling? Um, so we have the boilers, the water heaters and the ERVs on there. The, it's the ERV line heaters that, that maintain the air to 70, that's what those are. And then you can see on the top, each of those are a green line. And when it turns black, that's when that load has been shedded for a very, very minor amount of time and then turned back on. And there really is no general um, impact on people's comfort. We, I have been asking as, as our device has been doing this just to kind of see and test it out a little bit, but nobody's had any complaints about comfort. Nobody notices that we use it. So it's a really kind of cool device that Bill will tell you more about. And then we have net metering because we have the solar rooftop solar. Um, so the rooftop solar overproduces in the summer and then it will carry forward and bank the unused kilowatt hour credits to use in the winter when heating kicks into full swing and the usage is higher. So I definitely credit Holy Cross for this great slide and information because I pretty much sold all this from them. So thanks Holy Cross if you're listening. <laughs> but this is something they would provide all their customers is this kind of information if you do have solar panels and use net metering. So how big is our system here at the Borgen Precourt Center for Sustainability? It's a 41.58 kilowatt system. It covers nearly the entire roof. Um, projected, uh, it was projected annually that the system should produce around 57 and a half kilowatt hours, 57,500 kilowatt hours, and that would save us nearly $6,000 a year. Um, we recorded, as you'll see in a few slides, that in a year we actually, this last year, we actually produced 43.2 megawatt hours, um, or which is the equivalent to 43,200 kilowatt hours to compare that to what was projected. Um, we did notice in the winter we didn't produce a lot of um, solar because we did not clean our solar panels off. So it was one of those lessons learned that we're learned that we're going to evaluate how we can handle that next winter and effectively use our use our bank kilo, banked kilowatt hours as well as try, try to continue to produce some solar so we don't have some large bills, which on the next page I want to just show you quickly kind of what our bills look like. So this is for the last year for this building, this all electric building. We are on a small commercial rate because we are producing um, such, we're, we're not, we're, produce, we're producing, we're needing such little electricity and we're um, generating quite a bit of electricity and banking that over. So as I mentioned, we had snow on our solar panels and did not clean them off. So you can see in um, basically our January, February and March usage got really high. Um, and those are the highest bills we had all year. Otherwise, we really stay at that base uh, monthly charge from Holy Cross of the 1993, simply because of all the solar we produce and how little we're using. It's important to note um, that it since April, uh, we have been using the office much less and this whole building much less due to COVID. So um, that definitely skews numbers and we'll see how the next year goes and we'll just keep evaluating this every year. But, this is from our E-Gage, so you can see our performance. 
um, for the last year time frame, um, approximately September, mid September of 2019 to mid September of 2020, we used 51.9 megawatt hours, but we generated 43.2 megawatt hours. So we really only had to purchase 8.73 megawatt hours, uh, meaning we saved about over $6,000 um, on our utility bills. So per those projections that I showed you a little bit ago, we definitely saved that. We're right on the projections are a little better on saving that amount of money. Of course, however, it was a unique year. Um, we definitely did not generate um, as, as amount as, as what was projected, but again, we did have snow on our solar panels for a good portion of the year. And with that, I am going to hand it over to Bill and Bill's going to share some more information with us about more about, oh, I'm sorry. Oh yeah, managing peak demand. Again, I have two screens open, thought I was looking at the wrong thing. But go ahead, you have it, Bill, are you there? All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, greetings from Loveland, I'm down the hill, not, not the ski area, but uh, the city in Northern Colorado. So uh, glad to be here and talk a little bit about managing peak demand. Uh, this afternoon. So one of the things that I always think about is when you're controlling electric costs, you really have to divide controlling uh, those costs by either reducing kilowatt hours or controlling demand. And controlling demand often, most often, does not involve reducing kilowatt hours. You're just playing a game of electrical Tetris, so to speak, and moving those blocks of demand around so they don't all happen during one demand interval. Next slide, please. Next slide. So another uh, point that I wanna mention is when, when people talk a dem about demand, you have to, uh, be specific about what are you really talking about. And uh, uh, the meter only cares about peak demand during the billing month. So how do you get there? And that is you have instantaneous demand is the rate of use at any moment in time. And that drives your average demand over the demand interval, which is usually 15 minutes. And the highest 15 minute average interval is the peak demand. Next slide, please. Uh, we really have two general categories of rates. We have a two-part rate, which is also called the uh, energy only. And those are generally the small general service rates that you find with uh, utilities for small businesses. And I call these homogenized rates because they basically have money for demand that's built into the kilowatt hour cost. Now, once you get over the threshold between small general service and medium general service, you find a three-part rate while demand is billed separately and energy uh, per kilowatt hour is usually at a discount. Next slide, please. So here's, here's some uh, typical types of numbers that you would find with a, a low facilities charge or monthly service charge for uh, an energy rate and maybe 12 cents a kilowatt hour. On a demand rate, generally you have a higher monthly service charge, but some depends on the utility and you have a, a discounted, uh, and I, I apologize, that's supposed to be 0 0.0732, not 0 0.732. So seven cents a kilowatt hour. And uh, on top of that, you have your peak demand charge of $12.25 per kW. So. This rate can either be your best friend and come into work, uh, come into play for you or against you, depending on whether or not you control your demand. Next slide, please. Uh, as I said before, peak demand is what's actually billed and not the instantaneous demand. Um, if you think about how many uh, 15 minute periods there are during the month, you have generally 30 days times 24 hours times four intervals per hour. You have about 3,000 15 minute periods per month. And one of those is going to set the peak demand charge for the month. So we've learned over the last 45 years or so that we've been doing this, that um, you can't depend on a human to manage demand because they always fail. So you need some sort of autonomous automation 
to watch and see what the instantaneous demand is and the average demand is and make sure that it does not exceed either the demand limit that's set or particularly uh, the threshold between rates if you're playing that game. Next slide, please. Uh, a couple of, uh, uh, Nick, Nikki already showed a, uh, another customer, but uh, a couple of uh, uh, examples is, uh, this happens to be a time of use rate where we have an off peak uh, a time before 5 a.m. We go on peak at 5 a.m. to 9 a.m. then off peak again. And of course, this looks severe because some of our loads are turned off the entire time and then some of them are cycled or managed during the on-peak time. And in this particular situation, we have a number of uh, marathon water heaters on the high eight uh, bank of loads. So they can stay off for days without, well, many, many, many hours, usually two or three days without losing much temperature and we're cycling the electric heat. So this is an exa example of a, uh, a uh, time of use customer. There is no demand monitored or charged during the off-peak time, only during on-peak. So we care about just these uh, areas where, the red, where we're under the red line. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, there's a couple of different games to play with demand. And the first one, of course, is the straight demand reduction game. That's where each KW of demand is worth so much money. And this is generally the um, medium general service and large general service customers that are above that threshold. Uh, Holy Cross, as I understand it, has a 50 kilowatt rate threshold. And so if you go over that 50 KW threshold, you'll be on the demand rate. If you can stay below the threshold, then you'll stay on the um, small general service energy only rate. Next slide, please. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about this uh, in a moment, but uh, sort of my go, no go test is whether a, a, a customer can save money depends on load factor and the number of hours a day they build, the business is effectively open. Um, so, this gets into a lot of detail and I don't think we have time to really discuss this. So we'll move on to the next uh, slide. Uh, we love all electric buildings. I mean, once they're, uh, you know, if you don't have gas in the building, that means you have winter load, electric load to control and you get a much faster return on investment uh, for the demand management system uh, if it's an all electric building. Uh, so, uh, the, uh, the second game, go, go ahead to the next slide. The second game is this under 50 kilowatt or under 25 kilowatt in Excel territory uh, where you need to keep that customer below the threshold. Now, this game is got sort of a crossover at about 7,000 or 8,000 kilowatt hours per month for a 25 kilowatt customer. And you actually find that customers with 10,000 kilowatt hours are actually better off on the medium general service rate and controlling their demand to the lowest possible level. So it's imperative to really understand the load shape and uh, how that customer's building actually acts uh, monthly so that you can make sure to get them on the right rate. Uh, when we control loads, these are the types of loads we control. We love to find electric water heaters, electric heat. Uh, obviously, most buildings we find down here on the front range have air conditioning, uh, but there are a, a variety of uh, loads that you can control. And the important thing is that these loads have to have some sort of thermal storage or thermal momentum um, associated with them so they can be cycled for short periods of time without any discomfort, inconvenience uh, to the customer. The loads that we don't control are all the lighting, the plug loads, and uh, again, anything that would cause a uh, disruption, discomfort, or inconvenience, we don't like to control those. We have enough controllable load with uh, the loads on the other list uh, with uh, basically the space conditioning uh, to be able to mitigate the demand usually. Now, I wanna talk a little bit about solar and demand control because they work great together. Um, 
most utilities only charge for demand. I've never seen a utility yet that charges for uh, negative flow or kilowatt hours received back from the customer. They only charge it for kilowatt hours delivered or positive flow. So we really care about just when the amount of energy is coming from the utility to the customer, what the demand is. So this is a uh, particular, this is an actual customer here in uh, down in the Denver area that uh, the purple line is their actual total load and the blue line is the kilowatt hours delivered. And, and of course this customer has about a 30 kilowatt solar array. So they are 100% XL energy until just before 8 a.m. Uh, once the solar starts to come alive by 9 a.m., they're 100% on solar until just before 6 p.m. And then by roughly about 7 p.m., they are back on XL 100%. This is very common. Uh, go to the next slide, please. Uh, so this is your um, uh, dream customer uh, that has their solar, their, their, uh, their load is 100% coincident with uh, their solar. So all of this peak demand right here happened while they have zero kilowatt hours delivered from Excel. So this peak right here on this slide does not show up on their bill. Next slide, please. So this is the problem right here is that often customers' peaks are not coincident with their solar. And this customer, of course, is playing the under 25 game, but if they were uh, on a regular uh, demand rate, they would have received their peak of roughly 21 KW for that month, if that was their monthly peak. So uh, again, uh, this, this particular building is a church and they have an evening uh, uh, during evening function or some night during the week. And of course the sun has gone down or maybe it's just simply a cloudy day and very little solar production. And again, you get that uh, peak demand. So you can't really depend on solar to do anything reliably about your peak demand charge. Um, and uh, that's where the demand controller works in conjunction with the solar. So a couple of takeaways that this is about, uh, you know, how and when, not about how much. So we, again, we don't care about the uh, amount of energy used, only how it's used in every 15 minute interval. Uh, there are 3,000 15 minutes uh, periods during the month, and one of these is going to set um, the peak demand. Uh, I have a lot of small churches that have problems with crock pots and coffee pots when they uh, do a, uh, uh, a potluck dinner and they're playing that 25 kW threshold game. So uh, you have to be aware of uncontrolled base loads in trying to stay below the threshold if that's what you're doing. We, we, you know, we love to uh, uh, work in conjunction with all the other things. I love the uh, part on the insulation with the T-studs because anything you can do to tighten up that envelope makes demand control work even better because we're storing the uh, warm or cool air uh, in the building. And the demand management the system, as I said, is you're always on watchdog and rarely, I've, <laughs> rarely can this be done long-term manually. So uh, that's my presentation. If you'd like to talk more about this, please uh, feel free to uh, call me anytime. My information is on the next slide, I believe. And thank you very much. Thanks, Bill. We're going to uh, take some questions after Barry presents. So I'm actually going to hand it over to Barry now and I'll stop presenting so that he can, um, if I can figure out how to do that. Or maybe somebody can take it away from me. Stop share. Got it. <laughs> take it away, Barry. Are you there? Yes. Just figuring out how to share really quick. One second. Here we go. See it. It's perfect. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. 
No double no background. Doubles. Okay, cool. All right. Uh, okay. So yeah, I, I uh, my goal today is to kind of talk about some of the neat mechanical, electrical, and plumbing engineering systems of the of the building. Um, first, kind of a, a precursor. You know, Drew Rader is the mechanical engineer um, on the on the project. Drew couldn't be here tonight. Um, he uh, one of the things he does for a living is uh, test lift operations, and he's doing that right now over in Breckenridge. So he apologizes, but uh, he really should be the right guy for this because he did the work. Um, and uh, but I'm I'm here anyway. So uh, and and I wanted to kind of recognize a few other folks that were were key to this too, right? John Ryan Lockman, for those of you who know him, he was pretty integral in kind of some ideas and thoughts behind this. Keegan Winkeller with Berglund, uh, Megan Gilman. Um, and there's there's others right folks from our team and and some other Bergen folks and Mark in and that sort of thing but it wasn't you know this is just me talking but there's a lot of people behind some of the some of the neat things that were on the project um so I, I sat down with Drew the other day and we just kind of talked about some of the some of the neat items um and I'm going to kind of go through my list and uh, I'm not going to dive down in the trenches too much but I'll kind of talk about from a uh, a common sense and perspective point of view some of these things are really pretty neat. Um, um, you know, I, item one, energy conversation and future net zero operations were given high priority in the system selection of the building, um, systems selection. Uh, the project was never designed to be net zero upon opening, uh, but potentially with a bit of additional solar PV, we would have had that opportunity. Um, the plan at some point, if we, you know, uh, if, if, if Hockey Mountains wants to, is to add an additional PV panel uh, ground mounted to the north of the campus and and see what it would take and I, you know I don't I don't know for sure you know when and how that'll happen but I think we need to monitor the building for a few years and kind of see where how it actually performs and um, and go from there but uh, that was a big driving uh, factor in the design of the systems was was net zero um, you know Nikki's hit on a lot of these already but I'm gonna kind of talk about some of these again Cool feature number one, the building is 100% electric. I think that's probably the neatest feature in my, my opinion. Um, gas service was talked about stubbing into the building as a potential backup, uh, but I, I was in a meeting one day and we were all kind of talking about it and we kind of looked at each other and said, you know, the plan is not to use gas. Why are we gonna stub gas in the building? Let's just, you know, let's, let, we can do it later if we need to. Why do we do it now, you know? Um, so that was that was really neat. Uh, it was a, you know, when you when you're putting together a, a high performing building, you just want to make sure, and um, the engineering works. But uh, you never know, and and but the team kind of felt comfortable with their decisions and, and everything. And that was that was a neat, uh, that was kind of a neat deal. It didn't seem like a big deal of time, but after a while, we kind of like, huh, that was that was pretty cool. So everything in the building was designed for electrical use. Um, so. Nikki hit on this before, but electric boilers were utilized. Um, we have two electric boilers, and literally they're the size of a, I don't know, twice the size of a shoebox. These are not big boilers. These are pretty small components. And when you look at these things, uh, it kind of scares me a little bit. I mean, you get a big building full of radiant floor heat, and these two little two little uh, boxes are kind of heating up all our all our water, and it just kind of you look at you look, oh, wow, that just seems kind of strange, but it's performed well, you know, for, for a year and a half now, uh, you know, we, Kim and I and Nikki kind of were in contact last winter on some of the colder days, because I thought that might be a concern, but uh, they really have kept up pretty well. Um, kind of a neat sidebar fact, um, they're running about 75% of their capacity. So they're not even running at full capacity. Um, there was a, um, an electrical, um, rough in component that wasn't done for, for 240, it was done for 208. Uh, we, in lieu of putting in a step up transformer, we just said, let's kind of see how they perform. We're using le less electricity, so let's, uh, let's see how they do. Um, so, um, the, th that's turned out pretty well, but this is, this is the inside of the boiler. Uh, it's not much, a couple breakers, uh, an element, coils here, water coming in here through the through the elements and going out here. The delta T on these, for those that know what that is, it's just the what what you can expect the temperature increase to go per 
uh, per cycle is not much. It's, you know, three or four degrees, but uh, as it continues and as it goes, it, it, uh, it keeps up. So those were, those were pretty cool. Um, I was, you know, Brian Sipes, when we, we did the first building together, I was always, uh, he always kind of brought up to me that the size of the boiler for the original campus buildings is also tiny. It's really, really small. Um, when you look at big, good sized commercial uh, boilers and that fed two uh, buildings. And so when I saw these, these are even much smaller than that. I was like, oh my God, and they're, and they're electric. This is gonna be a problem. But they work great. Um, the next item is, uh, you know, I'm, when I was talking to Drew, radiant floor heating was used for lower and, and main level uh, heating components. Moving heat with water is much more efficient than by air. Um, so that was a big uh, decision maker in, in design the space. Um, and controls wise, there's some kind of cool features here, but we, we have an automatic outdoor reset of the heat wanting temperatures to reduce potential for overheating. So it's just a, uh, a gauge that goes outside. It'll check the outdoor temperature. If the outdoor temperature rises too much and there's still a call for heating on the inside, it'll, it'll kind of kick it off before, before you have an overheating issue. Um, um, the building cooling is not, there's not too much of it. It's just at the um, office spaces. Um, so, you know, on a, on a commercial facility, you might, you might put cooling in, in a few more areas. We, you know, the team decided not to. Um, and, uh, and it's been, it's been doing pretty well. The, these conference rooms that we're in right now get a little stuffy. Um, we, we have ceiling fans coming this fall to kind of see how, just get some additional air movement in here. Um, but, uh, but the, you know, it's, but it hasn't been bad. It's just uh, working with the shades and making sure they're down and, and all the time. I think that helps quite a bit too. Um, variable refrigerant flow systems were used for cooling and heating. Um, this is, you know, this, this goes with the heat pump technology. Um, this is something that you don't do. You know, heat pumps are pretty common, but the VRF type system is not. Um, so this provides more efficient cooling and heating than most other um, equipment. You can do heating and cooling simultaneously from a single heat pump. So that is, uh, that is something that um, you know, Drew mentioned that is, is pretty important for, for the use of our space. Um, the heat pump system serves all fan coils. And like I said, the fan coils are at the office spaces only. Um, the rest is radiant, radiant floor heat. Um, uh, Nikki mentioned the three ERVs. This was a code requirement. So this isn't anything, you know, super, you know, out of the ordinary, but it is neat the way they're controlled, right? They, they're controlled with an ox sensor rather than, um, you know, some, sometimes you, you set them at, at preset times. Uh, so the, so the ox sensor, uh, you know, ox sensor tells you whether the place is occupied or not, and then it'll come off. Um, Downstairs in the AV room and elevator machine room, in lieu of uh, uh, additional cooling or uh, some sort of way to, to dump heat load, there's just a transfer fan um, to get air and, and hot, hot air out of those two spaces. Um, so it dumps the generated heat into the common space that reduces the heating load. Um, you know, in the middle of summer, it could, you know, provide a little bit of heat in the different areas that maybe aren't required, but it's, it's common hallway space. It's not a, it's not a space that, uh, you know, has a lot of, you know, standing use for, for occupants. So it, it works pretty well. I haven't heard any issues with that. A um, couple, a couple other neat things that, you know, seem simple, but uh, they, they were kind of neat. Um, the plumbing system. Um, well, all we have are two boilers. Nikki mentioned this before, but we have two boilers for the entire building. We have one boiler downstairs that serves both bathrooms or both sets of bathrooms. It's adjacent to the two downstairs right in between. And then it serves the two, you know, uh, designed and, and installed right above. So you, it's not like a, another building where you might have a boiler somewhere off in the, I don't know, 80 feet away, sitting in a mech room and, uh, um, you know, you need a research pump and, you know, you have heat loss through the, through the um, lines and whatnot. This is right there. Um, no research pump, and uh, it was designed for those two systems, not for loss of heat or whatnot. So 
that was kind of kind of neat. You know, you kind of look at it on the original design, like hmm, not a big deal. But then when you think back, oh, that's that's pretty cool. Um, and then there's a small boiler that was installed in the um, storage space just for um, future um, laundry machine. And there's a small shop sink there. So it, it's tiny, but it, it uh, again, it's not one main boiler that you know has lines run throughout the space. Um, Nikki hit on this earlier, but I want to talk a little bit more about it. Um, one of the other cool things that we did in this building, we also did the main campus. And I, I think I would challenge our, you know, our building community a little bit to think about this on their project. We, we did a lot of electrical submetering. Um, there's dashboards available, but on, on our project, we, we have, we just use the each gauge front end and then on their, on their front entry, when you walk in, it's kind of tied into the lucid screen, which is a little bit more um, sexy um, uh, display, but, uh, but it doesn't need to be. Um, this equipment has come down quite a bit in cost and, uh, you know, ease of installation over the last 10 years. Um, you know, I, and, I, and I bought, we, we bought this direct. We didn't go through two sets of vendors or whatnot. Um, so, you know, I can tell you pretty candidly what the costs were. Uh, there's roughly $2,000 worth of equipment to, to put CTs and gauges around all the, all the pieces that we wanted to monitor. Um, you, you, you spend a few hours talking to tech guys online, uploading and making sure you got it right and get the CTs in the right spot. Um, and then you're done. You know, you have a, a monitoring system that uh, you can kind of tell what your building's doing. Um, and I, I, I think it's a, you know, I don't know. I, I don't know why we don't do this in more buildings because it's, it's pretty simple, easy and, and uh, pretty great for a building occupant to really kind of know, you know, right then and there what's going on. It was also helpful in us in understanding how the building performing and troubleshooting a few things. Um, we had um, a solar PV system that there was a, we weren't sure was uh, working right. It turned out that the the CT can on the outside of the building from uh, Holy Cross was was not operating correctly, and we were using the E gauge system to kind of well this doesn't make sense. We're showing this on the E gauge, but we're not showing it on the on the Holy Cross thing, why isn't it looking right? Um, so it was just super helpful. Some of those things are really helpful in troubleshooting and, and for the cost of these nowadays, it's, it's pretty um, cost effective. Um, the last thing I would say, and then there was one other thing I didn't put on my bullet point, but I wanna make sure we mentioned because Nikki kind of hit on it too. Um, we have a full lighting control system at the common spaces. Marmot was our electrical engineer. They you know, partially donated this. Uh, they, they felt the building was important to have this, but it provides substantially substantial energy savings over standard dimmers and switches, and it gives the owner and occupants a lot of flexibility. Whereas, you know, dimmers and switches, not always you do. You know, you, you can program things to do whatever you want, um, and it was it was a great you know great use of somebody thinking about the big picture and not just what was on the plans, um, and then. You know, I, I forgot about this, but Nikki mentioned it earlier. Um, the, the original campus had a, um, a building automation system, a BAS, which is uh, pretty costly to, to install. Um, it requires a lot of data points, separate contractors come in, control setup. So what that is, is just a, a very, um, I don't know, you, you use it in like hotels and that sort of thing. We have a lot of building engineers that need to know what's going on with the um, with a fan coil unit and a suite, and they can't necessarily get there at that point in time, but then kind of see some points on your system and know that there's a problem with the coil or whatever. Um, we did that in the main campus, and it was it was always money that probably was not well spent. Um, the, you know, the Wagamama Science Center does not have an engineer, so it doesn't not like anybody was really looking at the thing, and uh, it wasn't always working right, and it required maintenance every year, and a guy to come in and. Uh, look at it and that sort of thing. Um, just, you know, it just required somebody to be looking at it. Uh, so on this building, uh, one, of, one of the challenges from John Ryan and, and the rest of the team was, hey, what can we do for just regular controls guys without, you know, breaking the bank, but I still want to be able to have access in different spots and different locations. Um, and, and a lot of those systems are available now. Um, so the Honeywell thing that uh, Nikki showed you earlier was, was kind of a derivative of that design thought and concept because uh, um, 
it was it was kind of you know how how we got there was made sense and, and it's worked pretty well for them they, they have access to it and and they they have history and they know what's going on and so um that was kind of neat too those were kind of the kind of the the big picture design things that drew thought were important to to talk about um if you have you know any particular questions or whatnot yeah email Kim or I or whoever, and we can get back to you with some specifics. But uh, yeah, it was kind of a neat, neat design thing. And one of the neat things about it was it derived from history of what their other campus buildings did. So it's kind of cool. Thanks, Barry. Awesome. I wanted um, to- Thanks yeah, so much, Barry. So um, um, I know that we are now a couple minutes over time um, and our uh, presenter, Barry, has to take off. Um, so thank you, Barry, so much for being here. Um, there are a couple questions that we can cover really quick. And if there are any other ones, I encourage you guys to just shoot us an email. Um, the first question from Scott, are you looking at battery storage for islanding and peak demand reduction? Um, <laughs> Kristen replied, but Holy Cross is. Uh, I heard from Brian um, before he jumped off, <laughs> excuse me, that we left storage space in the employee housing um, buildings for a potential add-on for storage, um, but that that wasn't um, included in the original design. And then Scott's uh, second question, what is an induction furnace? And I'm not actually gonna be the one to be able to answer that. Nikki or Bill, do you have a, a thought for Scott? Do you know that? It, it came up when Bill was talking. Bill, I think that was during your presentation if you wanted to chime in. Um, I, I, I don't, uh, I don't recall, uh, saying induction. Well, I can't yeah. hear you, unfortunately. I got my mute off. Can you hear me now? Yes, Bill. Uh, Bill, I can hear you. Did you no, say no. induction no, furnace? I did not say induction furnace. I can't answer that question. So sorry, Scott, we don't have an answer for you there, but we could look into it. Okay, well, it sounds like we're drawing blanks on here on the induction furnace. Um, so sorry, Scott, um, but I think that is all for us. Um, so thanks everyone who showed up today. Uh, we appreciate you guys sticking around um, for a couple extra minutes. We'll send out the recording to folks and feel free to share it with anyone in your network. Um, but have a great rest of your night and thanks for joining us. Take care, everyone.